Why don't we... Okay, don't take it off or it'll be over. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, son. Okay, well, we're live. Okay, welcome, everybody. Uh, we started just a little bit early. Um, we're here with some kind employees from the state of Maine, and we're going to talk about the state of Maine's use of Agile today on Agile Gov Live, Agile Gov Leadership Live, I guess. Um, let me see if I can try to introduce some of these people, and I'm sure they'll have to correct me. Unfortunately, we have two Dougs today. We have Mr. Doug Bergfeld, easy to identify because he's wearing a hat. Uh, he is the black hat in this situation, and um, Doug Abril, who is by himself, and uh, Josh, and I'm afraid, Josh, I didn't get your last name, sitting with Mr. Bergfeld. Karstens. Okay, great. And so um, Doug Bergfeld, as I understand it, um, is sort of the heart of the cultural change for the state of Maine and um, some of the... Uh, business processes that have been done. Um, Mr. Bergfeld, could you tell us why the state of Maine chose to start moving in an agile direction and what progress you've made so far? Certainly. Thank you very much. Um, I think the reason we started to explore agile was some of the reasons that many people might have. We had a lot of development to do and a lot of projects to do, and the results from doing those projects in a waterfall fashion were terrible. And so what we attempted to do was, you know, we learned about Agile in, a, in, a, in one specific team, and we tried that out, and really the goal at that time was just to satisfy that one customer and be able to deliver what they needed to deliver. Well, as time went by, we noticed that it had some other effects, and the effects were on the development teams became happier, um, became more effective and more productive. productive. We also noticed that the business, um, not only were they required to be heavily involved, but they became more involved, more interested, because they felt as though they had some mastery over the work that they wanted to get done and started thinking more about their business process and less about what are those rascally developers doing over there. So it became clear right, that Agile was a thing that we needed to explore. We also got very lucky in that uh, we began uh, simultaneously a business process management discipline that Doug Averill is the uh, director of, which really focused business down on their business process. Well, it also happened that doing business process analysis in tandem with Agile was clearly the most efficient way to deliver um, value back to the customer because they got the value of the business process refinement and they got the value of short deliverables of high quality. And so that's what sort of created the momentum behind Agile. Now as we look at it and, and, and expand it to a more enterprise approach, we want to talk about how we can use Agile to increase the maturity and the effectiveness of not just OIT, the project management office, and BPM, but the agencies that we serve. So we increase the technical agility, the management agility, the business process agility, along with our delivery agility to create the whole ecosystem of growing mastery and growing maturity. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure our listeners will be shocked to learn that the state of Maine might have had some problems delivering software uh, right. like, <laughs> like, like the rest of uh, the federal government and the other states and cities uh, that, that we've talked to. And in fact, like industry did and does uh, before it adopted Agile uh, practices over the last 15 years. Um, you touched on something that actually I think is, is very interesting, and uh, I've dealt with it in, in private industry, which is sometimes you develop a situation where there's mistrust of developers. And I personally believe Agile is an antidote to that because it tends to just provide transparency. It's not necessarily the case that it makes people smarter or makes people work that much better, but it provides tremendous clarity um, in terms of uh, what the developers are actually doing and why they're doing that. Um, Mr. Averill, do you agree with that or have you had experience with that? 
Well, I, I agree to that. Uh, agree with you to, to a large degree. Um, the transparency is really the key here. We've had instances where we've uh, engaged developers who have come from a uh, a very large waterfall uh, series of projects, and really the transparency. Uh, when we bring them in to do a business process management development makes it clear that they're not a good fit either from skills or from methodology mindset um, so I wouldn't say that we're always going to get confidence I, I know exactly what you're saying in that um, the transparency that uh, Agile brings to a project allows for uh, that communication to happen for uh, for our business partners, our agencies, to understand what is going on. Um, but it also becomes very clear when things are not going on um, that there might be a problem. And in the, the one case where we had developers who had come from a uh, large series of waterfall projects and were not developing, um, we quickly had the opportunity to go back to our partners and say, you know what, we are both clear that there's a, an issue here. Um, and had a good conversation about do we want to continue this and, and to be clear this was not months into this this was literally days into the first sprint of the first project so I mean it's a great example of how it works um, but you know when you go into the next sprint our agency um, was not overly confident that they were gonna maybe not run into this again now fortunately we it was a lesson learned and we, we got uh, uh, more uh, uh, enabled developers on the next sprint uh, but it's really that transparency that allows for communication between uh, project management, application development, and, and our, our business partners to occur early and often. And I would right. Say, um, I would say to follow up with Doug that the, the confidence it comes in a different context. So instead of confidence that those people over there doing this work for us are not going to have problems, the confidence comes from we are going to have problems, but we as a group and as a team of agency exactly. and yep. developers are going to be able to solve those problems in short order. But visibility also adds a motivating factor to a team dynamic when you're looking at it and everyone can see your daily work when you're every morning when you're walking the board in your daily uh, stand-ups. You know, that's a motivating factor for the team. And usually that can help with the productivity. Right, right. So there are a lot of things we could talk about about that. Um, to me, one of the most interesting aspects of Agile is uh, the fact that it allows you to detect failure earlier in the process. So um, uh, one thing that that I never wanted to do to my bosses was to give them a negative surprise. Uh, I would give them a lot of bad news, but it would never be like, remember how last week I told you we were on track? Well, actually, we're three months late. And I think without Agile, that happens all the time uh, if you don't have transparency into what's going on. Um, so I'm not sure to whom to address uh, this question, but it's something that fascinates me because I don't think the industry has yet done a very good job building a financial model of software uh, development and technical debt and other tying um, the kind of actual business accounting to software development that for example exist in in construction uh, but have y'all had enough experience yet that you can tie agile back to an increased actual return on investment or saving of um, taxpayer dollars for the citizens of the state of Maine Well, Doug is probably the best one to talk about our ROI proposition. Um, what I'll say is what we definitely can show is the productivity of results over time so that quality is delivered quicker. And lots of that is because the number of kickbacks or the amount of rework right, becomes a lot smaller. The other uh, thing that we measure um, we really encourage our agencies to release small slivers of functionality early. That does two things for us. One is it gives them some value right now. So if they run out of money or something happens, right, they at least have that. They don't lose the whole thing. It also helps in constraining the scope because instead of building around things we think we need, right, because we don't want to make a mistake, we have live software that people are using so we know what needs to change and we know if 80% of the value is there or not very quickly. Right. Um, and and I, I would 
say that I mean, we are doing a, an okay job at looking at uh, business value and return on investment on our processes and the things that we're automating through BPM. But from my perspective, the hard part is when you have a waterfall project and in, in public sector, you go out to bid. The whole procurement process is really built around a waterfall proce uh, project. It, it has a very hard bookend, and anything outside of what you have bought is considered a change request. So what you end up with is something that has a big bang release, and you really don't modify for, I mean, geez, if you're the business, hopefully ever, but it's usually every couple of years. So that's one one way to look at it. The other is when you're doing Agile, it's really almost continuous development. So how do you compare it would have taken us this versus it now takes us this? Because they're just really two different mindsets, two different paradigms. You're really just getting what you need when you need it instead of getting all of it all at once and hopefully never have to do it again. And the question you ask business and the, and the, and the thing you're asking for a, a vendor to respond to is a little bit different. So you, you, you initiate projects. You still have to initiate projects with Agile. You initiate the projects talking about mission, business goals, and business value instead of a bucket of features. And so that also means when you go to RFP, you need to RFP for delivering on a business process um, uh, context, not a big bag of features that, that we somehow know that we need. We, in, in, in the process of Agile, we want to focus the value on what the business result is, the real world result, not whether or not this feature or that feature happened to be delivered. Well, that's all beautiful. Um, I'd like to follow up with some questions uh, on that. But before I do, let me remind the listening audience that you can submit questions uh, by chatting them in there to a text box somewhere on your, uh, your screen if you're watching through the Google plus uh, mechanism. We have one question from Tim Nolan, but I'm going to delay that uh, because I, I, I want to um, uh, tie this back to our last episode in which we had Mark Schwartz, uh, the CIO of the U.S. Citizen and um, Immigration Service, talking about something very closely related, which was um, that he viewed Agile as essentially all being in service to delivering things faster and delivering small chunks or slivers of functionality um, to the customer. Um, what I would like you guys from Maine to comment on is, uh, do you actually provide that, um, let's say, sprintly improvement or monthly improvement, or however you measure it, directly to the citizens of Maine? Or, you know, are, it, Sometimes that's a challenge. It's a challenge in the federal government. Uh, this, uh, you know, do you guys, are you able to actually deploy things live as quickly as you can develop them? And, you know, if not, what plans do you have to uh, work on that? That's a Josh Karsten's question, if ever there was one. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to hate Josh. We were referring to, referring to our, our release plan and, and putting uh, functionality out there as fast as we can. And, uh, you know, we, we initially when we started off, there's, um, you know, as we learned as we went, uh, things we could have done better and we could have done a better release planning. Uh, so that's one of the areas that we've been improving on. Uh, but, yes, your point, we're going to be, you know, developing our release plan to get that functionality out sooner to uh, the end users and to that extent to the citizens of the state of Maine as well. A lot of this improvement, um, you know, instead of it being manual processes now automated, which makes it a lot easier for them. Uh, you know, we have examples of projects where we have a uh, process that would normally have taken, I believe, 40 days and gotten it down to about four, uh, four hours, I believe, to process some claims. So for that extent, you can see the benefits to the end users for the state of Maine. So, yeah. so that's it, it. And one of the – go ahead. Oh, it, well, it bumps into sort of the culture, you know, the culture aspect, and not just the culture of OIT or the, the, the technology dudes and dudettes, but the culture, the culture of our, our business units, right? So they're used to a, a big bang culture. And so even though that creates an enormous problem, the bigger problem can seem, well, if we only deliver partial functionality, isn't somebody going to be disappointed? Well, that's infinitely more easy to manage, right, than a giant big bang. But it takes, it's part of the job of the COE to, to you know, get that message out, create examples um, of successful examples for people to look at, and really to evangelize this idea of continuous improvement that it's 
better to work a little bit constantly than to go big every five years. Well, to, to also to a further extent, it's better for them to, if you're just going to have a uh, release it versus waiting two years to do the big bang implementation on something, it really helps with the, the second part of just the delivery. It's also the change management, <coughs> you know, what you're going to have within the organization. By doing those, releasing those slivers uh, within the organization, it allows them to take these small chunks and learn and, and put them into production, get the end users, you know, having them go through it and use, using the application. So it makes it easier for that change process within the organization. Yeah, right. One of the things that, that Josh's uh, group is doing really well right now is um, making sure that the release plan is locked down during that sprint zero. You know, that we're not just getting a list of prioritized user stories in this case, but we're getting Epic's themes, user stories, and then we're going to talk about release planning and really not only getting the discussion around that, but really getting starting to get some, some solid commitment around that. What are we going to do? If we do these things, we are going to do the first release and have everyone nod their head early. doesn't necessarily make it easier in a culture where we're used to big bang rollouts, but it certainly gets people thinking um, that they have options here. Well, the uh, slogan that I sometimes used was uh, big bangs lead to mushroom clouds. And we've certainly <laughs> seen a lot of uh, government uh, catastrophic failures in which one way or another, you know, the taxpayers uh, out ten million dollars or sometimes a hundred million dollars for a large IT project that never gets turned on and certainly the state of Texas has done that as well as the federal government uh, in many cases. Um, so I'd like to remind our listeners that you can submit questions. Uh, it would be nice to do this and if I didn't um, emphasize it enough before, our previous episode with Mark Schwartz um, talked about some of the same issues that are being discussed here from a federal perspective uh, it's available on our YouTube channel. You might want to um, check that out. Um, but I, I'd like to go back to, um, uh, well, now let me um, bring in Mr. Nolan's uh, question. Tim Nolan uh, works here for a county in the state of Texas, and he's recently joined the steering committee of Agile Gov Leadership Live. And he asked, um, did you all run into any resistance within your organization, i.e. CIO, uh, middle management, for example. You, you guys have already discussed that by delivering things in slivers, it's easy to see that progress is being made and to head off catastrophes. Uh, I guess m my question for you is, are you delivering those things to your bosses? That is, are you delivering them on a friendly basis to the governor, for, for example? Because uh, it sounds like you're, you're not yet delivering them to the actual uh, external citizen on a, on a sprintly basis. Um, I would say that definitely from our CIO and from our commissioner's office, the support to go agile is strong. In fact, that is key to have that strong, top-down um, support for what we're trying to do. It, allow, it gives us the room to experiment, and to try and fail and to and to repoint and make it better and make it better and continue to improve the process. I think the resistance that we get is mostly around misunderstanding um, the difference in management style, the values um, uh, of agile versus the values of, of more of a command control structure. So team members, individual developers and, and team leaders, they love it. Once they get trained and they start doing it, they love it, love it, love it. Folks are nervous at first because they don't understand how the lines of command um, are clear and bright enough for their liking. And however, with you know, we just had a breakthrough actually. We just had a breakthrough um, with, a, with a group last week. And it took meeting, talking. We had an agile coach come in and actually speak to the, the leaders so that he could um, answer their questions and once their questions were satisfied it was easy to get agreement to try to try a little bit different structure so it's little by little success by success big bang and agile is just as bad as big bang and anything else so right. we want to make sure that we do it in a controlled um, uh, fashion but that we start and that we do it yeah and I you know I've, I've been in and out of IT uh, more out of IT than in uh, over my career but you know, I, IT, like a lot of um, places, are, are, 
are highly tactical and to sort of um, play off of what uh, Doug Bergfeld is saying that I think you know there's not usually resistance from what I've seen it's really you have to go in and make it real and model it and go through it and have people just understand what a day looks like and what the nuts and bolts are you, you almost have to say here are the concepts let's take a deep dive and if you can get people to spend the time uh, my observation has been they they all think it's great I mean if you if you're really doing it for real it works for everyone um, it's just that trepidation because you read the book but you don't really know what does it mean because I've got work to do and what if I get called off and it's just all of those things it's I, I wouldn't say it's as much resistance as just needing to understand what a day in a life and an agile really looks like mm -hmm. well my experience has been um, uh, similar with uh, the most recalcitrant executives they came around as soon as we started releasing things on time as soon as they could see that we were giving them the power to make engineering trade-offs that affected their bottom line they immediately became fans of agile even if uh, after reading the book they were very skeptical of it um, and it sounds like your experience has, has been um, similar uh, do you guys actually report um, so, so how do how do you report your progress to your superiors? Do you show a demo every sprint, or do you say these stories have been accomplished, or do you actually track a story point velocity? Well, let me first uh, give you a concept of the scale that that we're at. So, um, our COE and our OIT, we serve twelve thousand users across the state of Maine, every single state agency, every single line of business that they have. So our reporting structure is basically around the agencies that we are serving. So for instance, we'll have the, you know, the, the product owner is always involved in, 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 a, in approving stories. Actually, this is Josh's bag. Um, and, uh, uh, and that gets rolled up to their superiors, right? And to our superiors sort of more in the enterprise-wide, we report out our, our general status and also Things that have happened, good things and bad things that have happened over over the week or the month to our CIO, the governor's office, our commissioner's office. They they're very interested in, in, in what we're doing, which which helps a great deal. So um, so the structure of reporting has to be currently in the context of the customer that we're working with, though we do not violate the canon. <laughs> so then, if I if I may paraphrase you, Mr. Bergfeld, you're saying an agency becomes happy with the transparency they're getting from the Agile process and then they say to the governor we're mighty happy with what they're doing whether the governor understands the nuts and bolts of, of that reporting or not. That's true but we also go directly so what we have is our you know our you know our boss and, and when we have a chance ourselves we report up that chain all the way to the top and say what's going on and that is supported by the reports in the field. So if we have a happy customer, that's always a good thing, and we hope that message is going to get where it needs to get, but we'll make sure it does. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I, there's more we can talk about on that, but we always try to respect the customers from the audience, and we have a question from Mukesh Dalal um, that takes us in a slightly different direction. Um, I used to be a federal employee, and I know that Although there are a lot of federal IT people trying to manage things, 90% of the work gets done by contractors. And Mukesh is asking about um, business, and I assume in this case he means the outside businesses which the state of Maine interacts with. Uh, if that's not correct, Mukesh, maybe you could chat in an, an, uh, an improvement to that. His question is, can you share the response from business, by which I assume he means IT contractors, to the Agile approach, how have you engaged business, and I assume he means by that contractors that you employ. Perhaps you could start out by just uh, telling us what percentage of the total IT firepower employed by the state of Maine is uh, contractors as opposed to actual employees of the state. I don't think we, actually, you know who knows that is Kirsten, but I, do you know it? <laughs> well, I think it depends on, on the projects that we're doing. Usually within our BPM projects, and Doug can speak up if I'm incorrect, usually uh, I would say about half of our 
project teams are contractors. Usually our developers are contractors. And our, our business um, architects and scrum masters are usually state employees. However, we do have um, another side of that where we do uh, straight scrum IT development where I think there's more of a mix of state employees and um, and contractors. But for our BPM projects, the majority of our developers are contractors. Mm -hmm. yeah. and you, go ahead, Mr. Abel. No, I was just going to say, uh, Josh and I had uh, met on site with a... Um, uh, development team a few weeks ago and we went through our expectations of them not so much in what they could do um, within the platform that we use but specifically their approach and methodology and um, you know we, we had a, a I thought it was a pretty good conversation around what we expected of them and it was really to deliver horsepower to the project um, and the expectation was, and it was somewhat surprising to them, is that we're doing this in a purely agile way. That we are, we're expecting them to show up, be Scrum enabled, um, and to to pull those stories that they've committed to, to get them done, deliver them back. And there were uh, quite a few questions around, well, what happens if this? What happens if the customer's not happy? What happens if what we developed wasn't what they were looking for? Um, and we just kept re reassuring them that that's not, in this case, their problem. It's really it, the the business needs to take ownership. There needs to be commitment. That's something that we've been coaching them through all the way, start to finish. So, um, you know, I th I think there's a lot of different um, flavors of of Scrum when people claim they're doing Scrum or when they claim they're Agile. Um, right. But at the heart of it, it's got to be collaboration between business and developers, the whole team. Um, and if that's not there, then you know, I would propose that you're not really doing Agile. You know, and that, that it was interesting to me. It was somewhat surprising to this uh, to this vendor that that was how we approached it. And they they were happy by that. That was that sounded like good news to them, but it, it didn't sound like it was typical. So, um, Mr. Abril, I believe you are the head of the business project process management office. Um, when you use the term business, you you mean the agency within the state that is acting on the citizens to fund things and set the requirements right Pre you don't precisely. mean it, you don't mean an outside firm you mean the business owner in the in the sense of the person who doesn't necessarily know computer programming but knows that there is a need that they have to get done through information technology right business to us is uh, those are our agency partners Okay. And if they choose to bring in external vendors, then they're a vendor. But right. we ultimately report to the person who receives the, the funding, whether it's a state or federal or other, um, who are there to uh, fulfill a policy mission that is theirs. Right, right. And one thing that's a little weird is um, back when I was learning this from Kent Beck, we always used the term customer. And we said the customer is in the room. And the, the customer meant the end user. In a lot of government cases, the citizen is not paying for things the way they do from a firm, right? They're not buying anything. They're getting their garbage delivered that they paid for in terms of taxes, for example. So the, we use the term customer and it, it interchangeably with end user um, in, in some uh, cases. Um, okay, so um, this is very interesting. Um, I'd like to go back maybe to Mr. Carson's and talk about a few of the technical aspects of Agile development and see where you are. Um, in particular, it sounds like you have um, taken a step down the road of continuous development, that you are doing um, sprintly builds or perhaps even nightly builds, that you have a continuous integration system uh, working um, but that you are perhaps still trying to contract, shrink the time uh, from development to being able to demo or deliver um, a particular feature. Uh, can you discuss where you are in terms of progress towards continuous integration? Well, I, I think to your point for uh, demo, what we do throughout our sprint, you know, it's usually we, we like the cycle of development, demo feedback, development, demo feedback, because what we want to do is throughout the sprint while we're working on the user stories, 
we want to have a little piece of the, ta the task that the developers get done, we want to present that to the product owner to make sure that we're doing what they want, we're fulfilling what their needs are. And so throughout the sprint, we continue that cycle. And then toward the end of the sprint, we obviously have our sprint review where we're presenting what we believe is the finished functionality of this and to them. So, um, so, uh, so, so we do that review and to the uh, customer and hopefully, obviously, if we're doing that demo throughout the sprint, uh, there shouldn't be any surprises and we should be delivering based on what our sprint goal is and what our acceptance criteria and our definition of done. Uh, so we do that constant feedback with the customer. So one of the problems that happens at the, in the federal government is that people mistake the big boss for the end user. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll do a sprintly demo to the head of the agency. Um, but the head of the agency is a poor representative of the end user because they tend to be an expert in the subject matter in question. They may be more computer savvy than the average citizen is and um, for other reasons. Um, when you say you give a demo, uh, are you giving it directly to the end user or do you have difficulty actually, sometimes there are legal problems finding the end user, uh, or, or are you demoing to some proxy for the end user? It's, it's really different stakeholders within it, right? So usually within the team we have the product owner, so we're going to be providing, uh, showing them what, what was developed and getting their feedback. But obviously we want to get some of the users of the actual application. The product owner may be the individual who has a lot of the knowledge of uh, what the business wants, right? But may not actually be the one that's in there using this application throughout on a daily basis. So we want those end users to come in. So if you're going to be the one sitting at your desk using this application, by all means, we definitely want to show them of what we're developing to see if this is actually going to meet their business needs. And so along that point, at the end of the sprint, we always do the big review, and then we also have some other stakeholders, and it could be uh, the executive sponsor or executive level stakeholders as well. So we try to have a combination. Uh, obviously, the better we do that, then usually the better uh, delivered product uh, is going to meet the business need. But I think we do very, very well at, you know, sprinting along, getting acceptance, showing it to end users and product owners, getting stuff done and in the can and ready to release. Our, our challenge is getting them to actually go live with a sliver. So the sliver's done and it's sitting in a can. So we would prefer, and we're working on that, to get that release out and in the public um, where business is still sort of resistant to it. But as far as the software being done, working approved and ready to rumble, we're pretty good at that. That gives the buy-in as well, too, right? When you have that release plan, you're doing those every two to three minutes of releasing that functionality. You're getting that the user buy-in as well. They're in there. They're starting to use it. They're seeing the benefits from it. So they're seeing what that the business needs. We're meeting that. So And then we get that feedback from them. And say, you know, so it, it helps us out as we go along and continue throughout the release plan. Yeah. We, we, we have one um, project that... Um, in terms of how it's structured and how it works, I think is, is going pretty well in that um, the executive sponsor has um, sort of private, uh, almost every other day, check-in meetings with his product owner. So he knows what the product owner is elaborating on and, and what the product owner is seeing. But the feedback I get from him, the executive sponsor, who reports directly to the governor is, how come I'm not seeing burn down? Why are we flatlining? So he's looking at... Um, on one hand, with the product owner, he knows what should be being developed and is getting that feedback, but from delivery and from us is saying, how are things going? And he obviously has that transparency because he's going in and looking every day or two at his burndown charts and is calling us in and wants to know what the heck is going on. Well, that, that's fascinating. Um, there are a number of questions uh, that I would like to ask about that, but let's talk a little bit about burndown charts. Um, so you're describing a situation, I think, in which for whatever reason, and this certainly happened to me when I was managing teams, where sometimes you would have like a zero velocity sprint that looks horrible, you know, yeah. uh, but the, the, tr the truth is if, if your velocity chart is too smooth, you should suspect that someone is cooking the books, right? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of jitter in the velocity of, of any team. But 
it, it sounds like you've reached a pretty good level if someone is looking at a burn down chart and sees a, I'll, what I'll say is jitter, sees a low velocity sprint and, and ask a question, why is this a low velocity sprint? Is that really happening? Absolutely. We get that all the time. And usually, you know, the, the burn down is not necessarily stating that something is wrong, just an indication that we need to look in to see what's going on here. So if we see what we call flatlining, uh, usually that's that's an issue. We, we had we had that quite a bit learning on, uh, early on. That was part of our learning and maturity as we went. So right. we started looking into why are we getting this flatlining initially. So we started looking into it and realized we had, you know, our user stores were too large. We needed to really just split them up and get them to low sizes so we get those small small victories going on, and then you can see that stair stepping down the burn chart. So usually when we see stuff that that's not the norm, it's an indication that we need to go and take a look and see what's going on. So, and the burn down chart's a communication tool, too. I mean, if, if you're seeing something, I mean, Josh and I have kind of gotten into this rhythm where I know not to send him an email saying, what's going on with this, until at least day five or six in our three-week sprint, because... I mean, the first week, they're just working on things. They're just pulling tasks and starting to move things across the board. By the second week, you know, I'll be asking him, and he's usually telling me, geez, FYI, here's what's going on. But it's just a communication tool. If you're not, if you're at all concerned, and that would include um, executive sponsors who report directly to the governor, go look at the scrum board. Are things moving across? Do the task hours make sense? We had a conversation earlier in the week where, you know, you've got 240 hours planned, but you task everything out, and you have 500 hours worth of tasks. It's like, whoa, you know right away before you even started you're probably going to have a problem. So you just start those communications early. And I think there's been some good past, uh, some good um, early lessons learned that Josh's team has put into place. It's really nothing more than an eight-point user story because those 13s always get half done and never get completed. And sure, you can tell... Uh -huh. Our customers will bring it back in on the next sprint and we'll finish it out because it'll be mostly done. They don't want to hear that. They want to see burn down. So you just break those down into early to smaller chunks earlier, and then we can demonstrate successes um, all the way along. Well, that's lovely. So that uh, I have come to the same conclusion in different ways. Of course, different people use um, different ways of doing estimation. It sounds like you're using the industry standard kind of Fibonacci scale story point estimation, um, uh, which I like and I have found a lot of um, value in. Um, some people succeed using uh, a different system where they only keep track of the number of stories, but in doing so, they must standardize the size of a story in terms of effort. So I personally prefer the story point estimation mechanism uh, that you guys are, are using. So I think it's actually very impressive that you have reached that level of sophistication. Um, and I would just like to point out how wonderful it is that um, a governor or, or, or someone who's in charge can ask that question. You know, because without an <laughs> agile thing, basically you just don't know that things are going off the rails, right? You, you're unaware of a problem. And so, uh, Agile is giving leadership a visibility that they never had before. And so it's important to understand that, sure, this creates problems, but it, it is only in the sense that you're becoming aware of problems that always existed, but you didn't have any way of seeing them before. Right. And one of the fundamentals of Agile, right, is customer collaboration. So we're having that communication early on with the stakeholders. Uh, we usually will go over the, a lot of the uh, metrics, especially like the burn down, to show them what this means, what they should be looking out for, uh, so they can ask those questions. And also so they're educated on the entire methodology that we're using. And, and I will say that um, the only consolation to getting yelled at that we're flatlining is that I know the fact that this executive sponsor is actually looking at his burn down charts and actively engaged in the project, which I mean, it's all you could ever ask for, because then you can have a, a, an honest conversation about, do we need additional resources? Do we need to talk about functionality? Um, it leads to the question, and as long as we're constantly framing it in the, okay, I hear what you're saying, I see the same thing, here's what it means, and what are we going to do about it, um, those conversations tend to be smaller and not some major, you know, you're bringing in a vendor and you're about to take legal action and kick them out because suddenly you realize that you're years behind. We're talking about I'm off schedule by four days. Okay, so how do we get back on schedule by four days or whatever it is? Right, right. 
Uh, yeah, and the way I like to think about it is Agile gives you a way to make a rational trade-off. If you have to drop a feature to get back on schedule, you want to be able to make that decision in a rational way. Agile doesn't tell you whether you should drop the feature or not. It gives you a mechanism in which an executive can make a reasonable decision on the value right. of that. Right. Um, so let, let me ask you guys something and um, express maybe some controversial opinions uh, in doing it. So, you know, when, when Kent Beck was first talking about extreme programming 15 years ago and was explaining all this, uh, one of the things that he was trying to do was to emphasize the authority of the end user, which is what you guys would call the business person in, in, in a certain way, to prevent this notion that developers are sometimes bullies. And it, it, there's a, a whole book devoted to the idea that developers are actually bullies. It's called uh, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And it puts forth the proposition that developers use their magic power, right? They're the only ones who can write the code to twist um, what the business process really wants into what the developers want to develop in, instead of, of doing that. Uh, I personally believe Kent created Agile as a little bit of an antidote to that, although I never accepted the idea that developers were bullies. Um, uh, but it raises the question, who writes the user story? And, you know, I personally would love to have the end user write the, us write the story. You know, it, the, the person who has to fill out the tax form for the IRS should write the story about how the IRS is going to improve the tax form. Mm -hmm. However, that can be mechanically <clears throat> difficult in some cases. And it's also the case that you often need developers to tune the language of the story so that it's something realizable, so that it's something that can actually be done. So the opinion I came to is that story writing should always be a shared responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you guys think about that? All right, we had a couple, well, okay, there's two things. The, uh, on the story writing, right? Story writing is a discipline on to its own, right? Product ownership is a trained, disciplined skill. And our business owners don't always have a super well-trained product owner laying around or any time to devote to them. Some do. I mean, we have one project where the product owner is fantastic, went through the training, has all kinds of time to devote, and is doing a great job. In the case where they don't, we have to provide them that expertise by providing a professional product owner who can work with um, the business side product owner to create the stories where the product owner adheres to the quality of the story and the actual person from the business relates the actual need <clears throat> that the business has and her understanding of the business's process and the business's goals. So absolutely, it's a, it's, it's a team effort, where but it can't be done in a vacuum and it can't be done with long intervals of time between contacts, right? This is something that resident with the team, right? Both those entities are with the team. They're not off in a corner somewhere. Um, working it out and then delivering it to the team. It's all together in that group because stories need a lot of tuning and a lot of grooming and they can only happen with people together. But what I really want to say, which is the controversial part possibly, is that we have, it can sometimes be true that in the state context and, and in many other contexts that we have the completely wrong idea of accountability. And so we want to use Agile as a way to hold developers account or hold business accountable for their story, hold developers accountable for their work, right, in which case developers are some kind of a mine where we're just going to mine out all the Java, right, and then right, and throw them away and get another one. Um, accountability isn't a thing that we try to hold people to. It's a set of behaviors that we want to encourage. So accountability is a concept, but it's a set of behaviors. And so if we encourage the accountable behaviors, then we never have to get to this conversation about how come you didn't do the thing I wanted you to do? Because everyone is behaving in a more mature and accountable fashion. We don't actually have to right, have that terrible conversation about how come you let me down. Well, it just at the risk of sounding difficult and uh, uh, often belligerent, but these are the conversations. These are these fun, wonky, agile conversations that Doug's get into in the hallway. I, 
I once again disagree with you to some degree here, Doug, in that um, in many of the agencies, and you know what I'm going to say, many of the agencies, um, as soon as you put someone who is a professional product owner between them and the developers, you really, you've buffered them from having that accountability. And I completely agree the idea of professional product ownership is um, one of those milestones we're going to realize uh, further down the road where we have arrived that culturally we're at the point we can have professional product owners. Um, there's such a lack of accountability when it comes to understanding your processes, your applications, the functionality, the, the, the granular features that they need to provide um, that I, I am um, much more of the mind that we need to be training those agency, our, our customer product owners, to write those stories. And I think from, from our projects, we've seen greatest success when they do that. You know, I had a meeting last week with a product owner. I went through something that I have to say should have been done by the developers. I mean, it was pretty 101 level stuff. It feature wasn't there, but his attitude was, well, geez, I guess I better put in a user story and let the executive sponsor know that I missed this. And I said, geez, you know, I think this is something we can work with you on. But he had gotten to the point where he was completely on the hook for it. He was totally accountable for the lack of feature. And if there were someone in between, um, at least for where we had come from with them, that wouldn't have been the case. It said, well, so-and-so missed it. It wasn't I missed it, and I need to talk to the executive sponsor about that. So I, I get what Doug is saying. I agree with it fundamentally, but I don't know that we're quite there yet. Okay. okay. Well, I personally would like to say that, um, you know, uh, I've been very influenced by Kent Beck, and he always emphasized guidelines rather than rules for Agile stuff. And I think it's wonderful that our listeners can see intelligent, professional practitioners disagree upon some <laughs> aspects of Agile because the truth is it's it's not it's not a rule book. It's a way of doing things that you adjust as you learn what is effective for your organization. Um, and particularly the issue of end users is and story writing is always a little bit of a, a trouble because every end user is different. Some people have the customer in the room as is the ideal situation in an agile environment and some people don't. Uh, they have to use a professional proxy or product owner in the place of the customer uh, and and there's all spectrum in between. Uh, so we only have 15 minutes left. If there's anyone listening to this I would encourage you to enter more questions if you if you want to have, have questions there. Um, so I would like to um, go ahead and talk about a couple things which might or might not be controversial. Um, let me tell you what they are so we can get ready for them. I would like to talk about user experience design and how you view it relating to the Agile process that you're using. And then finally I'd like to return to something that um, Mr. Bergwell said which is also very relevant to the federal situation uh, which is it seems like you, your process may have leapfrogged what you're calling the business, which is really the agency within the state of Maine, the business's ability to deploy features as quickly as you produce them. And of course, we live in a world where there's a certain contradiction. A lot of times an agency wants a bug fixed right away, but if you fix a feature, they say, oh, well, we'll deploy it three months from now. Right. And right. You say, <laughs> yeah. But the, the citizens asked for this. Why should we delay them getting it for three months? Uh, and you, you have a little bit of a, a crossroads there. So I'd like to I'd like to address both of those questions in the last 13 minutes, if we can. Could could you guys comment on the role of user experience designers and how you see it fitting into the agile framework you use, and how you use professional user experience design without falling into the trap of shifting all the way back to big design up front. Yeah, do you want me to, I can yeah, probably talk ahead. to that. I, I'll ahead. say uh, generally um, not doing it and not well from, from the projects that we're on um, for a couple of reasons. One, don't have a lot of um, platform specific experience in doing that. Had a great conversation with someone yesterday in, in Doug Bergfeld's area about 508 accessibility which I would throw under UX UI um, right. and it's not it's not happening and it's it needs to mm -hmm. get done so the the, the thought is um, and you know this is really just sort of um, 
planning at this point is that we start making it part of that uh, um, you know accessibility part of the acceptance criteria especially of uh, user stories related to, to UI whenever there's sections or forms um, and then also include some amount of time for a UX expert in the development team, same as we would for QA and unit testing and things like that. But I can say it's absolutely not happening right now, and it's a big, it's a, it's a problem. Okay, well, <laughs> there, there we go. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about cultural change. Um, when I was in private industry, we had the same situation in that we could deliver things quickly that we knew were valuable to the customers but the business side of our operations were geared up for uh, date based releases and furthermore we were under a lot of pressure because uh, large organizations that would use our, our service would say we demand this bug be fixed within 36 hours and we would fix it and then they would say well we, we want a feature but we're, we refuse to deploy new software for another six months unless it's a bug fix which created a, a giant tangle of release management now you may not be in the same situation but you might be it might be the case that your agencies are basically saying well we're, we only want to deploy new software once every six months or once every year or something like that um, but in the end, Agile is not to make developers happy. It's to get better services and products in the hands of the end user. So if you don't deploy what's built, you're not accomplishing very much. So, Mr. Bergwell, you look like you want to comment on that. Oh, I'm glad I was transparent. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so the, the problem is, is this is not a technological problem at all, right? This is a question of how agencies or business units or end users how they respond to change at all technological change performance changes any change and you know if you think about what projects waterfall projects did for these folks is that they took the change and they kept the change away from everybody for absolutely as long as they possibly could until bamo here it is and by the way it's a done deal, and you'll all get used to it. Please don't quit. <laughs> and and it was and it's chaos, right? Training, offsite training, onsite training, uh, warranty period. Blah, blah, blah. It's just a mess. And and so, but that's good because they don't want to change is hard, and people get scared. And they don't want to talk about it, right? It's going to be a problem. Let's keep put off the problem until we're eighty nine percent done, because it'll probably fail by then anyway. And we won't have to do anything. So um, so. Part of our job in the COE, and my job as evangelist, is talking about how agile techniques and agile ways of thinking can help an agency respond to changes of any kind, whether they are in differences in the way they want to perform, differences in business process, differences in leadership, there's new laws, to um, use those, the same idea of understanding mission and goal and doing only things that achieve those goals rolling them out in small pieces so that cultural change can be consumed by what, you know, culture, right? It's a whole bunch of people. It's atoms, right? It's not a big thing. You're pouring sand. You're not pouring rocks. And so you've got to touch every single one of those grains. And there are ways of doing that in a planful, humane way so you save the talent, right, that you need to keep without disrupting the whole place. So it's not really change management because that's really how do I keep things the same and not disrupt everybody long enough to get this change through. It's more change leadership. How does my organization respond to change for this change and every change? That's a bigger problem than, than uh, and that's the, that's, the, that's the core of why it's hard to get slivers released, because it means a change, and we might not have thought about it yet. And Josh, of course, and Doug have been working to operationalize this concept of getting the change to the organization embedded in you know, when we first start talking about these applications. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's one of the hardest things, you know, one of the more difficult things that we're, we're struggling with is, and, you know, we try to get that early education on with the business uh, to understand the value of the releases, the value of having the release plan and following it. And obviously there's some things that we can do to try to minimize the bugs um, 
so we don't have to uh, you know go back and constantly do the bug fixes. But a lot of it's early education, and then once they start seeing the value of it, I think uh, and the successes that we are having in some areas, uh, you know, then I think that's a good tool to uh, use to help them uh, understand of the, the value of the release plan. And it will take right uh, a, a pipe, you know, a visible agency, um, you know, being successful is slivering. It also helps that when they ask the question, well, what happens when people complain that we're only going to be able to take orders and aren't able to fulfill them yet? If we already have a plan that we can show them or a framework that they can use to, to manage that piece, because you got to manage something, right? You either got to manage this big bang or you got to manage a lot of little bangs or little pops. Um, and and they, they feel like they know how to manage the big stuff, which, right? So they just need to be taught and to learn and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we sort of lead by their side a little bit until they discover the way that's going to work for them. So I'd, I'd like to suggest something that might seem like just a science fiction fantasy at this point. But, you know, what I would really like is for the actual citizen to get involved and see changes happening rapidly and understand that that is happening because of an mm -hmm. agile process and start demanding agility from its government IT services. You know, uh, here in Texas, we have flash floods and tornadoes and trees fall on power lines, you know, and the citizens want their power fixed in 36 hours, right? You know, they expect the government to try to solve these problems for them. Uh, I would like to see the government start, or the citizens start demanding the same thing of broken websites and hard to use, uh, user interfaces and m things that aren't friendly for mobile applications that they are trying to use. And I believe we need to raise consciousness and explain that Agile is a process. It doesn't necessarily have that much to do with computer programming, but it has everything to do with getting feedback from the customer quickly and responding to it as quickly as possible. Well, in, in this, about, go ahead, Josh. Think about think about the big picture too. When you're talking about the federal government or the state agencies, right? And you're talking about a citizen. Um, look at the benefits that Agile has versus the waterfall. Look at the amount of money that's usually a, a large, the percentage of failed projects within waterfall versus an Agile. I know you got, you know, you got the chaos manifesto by the Standish Group. You know, I think the last one was I think around 30 percent failure rate for waterfall projects, and that's just failure, not the challenge ones as well. Um, or, yeah, thirty percent failure for waterfall, and about only nine percent failure for agile. So the benefit there is just the the, the, the cost, the savings of tax dollars that they have. They're not wasting uh, a lot of tax dollars on failed projects or over budget projects. So there's a lot of benefits out there to agile, and and a lot of studies that have been done about it that show that show that it's much more successful than waterfall. And I would just add that um, you know iterative development is really the end user expectation at this point. I mean, how often do you look at the App Store or the Google Play Store? Your apps update all the time. I mean, every few weeks there's a new version of it and you go in and it gives you a splash screen, here's what's new. That's what we expect. And there was a great study about two years ago by the National Association of State CIOs about a survey of citizens asking what is uh, efficient and effective government mean? And it's not what most of us in government think it means. It's not fewer people um, passing paper. To them it means I interact with my government the same way I interact with my app store, with Amazon, or with anything else. It's, it's available. It satisfies my need when I need it. How it happens, they don't really care, but they need to know that it works on their schedule and their time. So, yeah, I, I, uh, we've been talking a lot about that as a mindset when we talk about release planning and also are, are really looking for better ways to incorporate that end user feedback directly into an application kind of comes back to the UX and UI and those other things too along with release planning. Okay, well thank you very much gentlemen. I'm afraid we're almost out of time. I would like to close now, um, maybe give you guys just a few seconds to make some final remarks. Let me point out that um, I personally have enjoyed this interview very much. Uh, I think the state of Maine is in a real leadership position here. Agile Gov leadership as a group would love to help the state of Maine and these people convey their knowledge to other people who may be struggling with Agile. That's one of the reasons we exist as an organization is to connect people who are 
effective leaders with people who want to start leading this sort of thing. And so through our LinkedIn groups, through our website, and through this video, which if you were not watching it live, you will be able to see at uh, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, um, we hope that we can do that. Um, so now, gentlemen, um, do you have perhaps any final thoughts before we go off the air? Yeah, I, I would just say, I'll pass it over to those guys that, you know, every sprint, every project has lessons learned in it for us. You know, I mean, we're trying to follow the book, but we're still figuring it out. So um, as much interaction as uh, with others who are doing it so we can understand their lessons learned, the better off. I mean, let's, let's all stay uh, connected on this stuff. Thank you. And I, I second that. That's really what we want to do, right? We want to reach out to others and, and learn what they've gone through, uh, learn, take their lessons learned, and hopefully implement them here. Uh, it's all about that knowledge transfer and, and getting to that level of agile maturity that we all want to be at. Yeah. And, you know, agile is a little bit like playing the drums. It's uh, easy to get started on. It's really hard to master. Um, it's absolutely worth the effort. And I, and I want to echo that, right? I love talking about this stuff, as you might have guessed. Um, so folks who have questions or folks who have information for me that I can use to make my place better, that's all great. And the last thing I'll say is just start. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's close with that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate your time. Uh, Soan, perhaps you could take us off the air now. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, Soan.